What's up movie buffs, I hope you're having a good day. Back in 1931, the legendary Charlie Chaplin released what many believe to be his masterpiece, the silent classic City Lights. Let's take an in-depth look back at the movie and discuss why it has endured for so long. Charlie Chaplin was a little late to enter the talkie era which was fully underway by the time he released The Circus in 1928. Chaplin was expected to transition into the talkie era and felt a lot of pressure to do so right away. However, due to his popularity and power in Hollywood, Chaplin was able to still star in and direct another silent film, which turned out to be City Lights. Chaplin was dismissive about talkies in interviews and once told a reporter he gave the talkies three years and that's it. We all love Charlie Chaplin, but yeah, that's been the longest three years ever, don't you think? Chaplin was also unsure how he would translate his reoccurring character, known as the Tramp, to sound films, as part of the appeal was that the physical mannerisms and expressions of the character spoke for themselves. Chaplin played the Tramp in 13 films and knew why the character was a success, so he was reluctant to jeopardise that. In early 1928, Chaplin started writing the script for City Nights with Harry Carr, who was actually a reporter and columnist for the Los Angeles Times. The idea for the film came from a character in Chaplin's last movie, The Circus, a circus clown who goes blind who has to hide his handicap. This inspired the blind girl character who is a big part of City Lights. Chaplin actually fought up the iconic ending of City Lights first, involving the tramp and the blind girl, and wrote a highly detailed description of the scene as he, and many people in years since, considered the ending to be the centre of the entire film. Chaplin's character of the Tramp is the only character in the movie who is listed by name or nickname in this case. The blind girl is simply known as just that, and the eccentric millionaire character in the movie is only known by that moniker also. Pre-production began in May 1928 and Chaplin hired Australian art director Henry Clive to design the sets, and eventually actually cast Clive in a role in the film The Drunken Millionaire Who The Tramp Encounters. During pre-production in August of that year, Chaplin's mother Hannah Chaplin died at the age of 63. Chaplin was distraught for several weeks and production did not start up again until fall. A psychologist by the name of Stephen Wiseman claimed after seeing City Lights that it was autobiographical, with the blind flower girl in the movie representing Chaplin's mother and the eccentric millionaire character depicting Chaplin's father. Chaplin interviewed many actresses to play the part of the blind flower girl, but was unable to find the right one until Virginia Sherrill approached Chaplin and asked if she could work with him. Chaplin decided to give the young actress a screen test, and she became the first actress he had seen who was able to subtly and convincingly act blind on camera, and this was down to her condition of nearsightedness. Chaplin offered Cheryl the role in November 1928. Filming for City Lights officially began in downtown Los Angeles in December of that year, and filming was incredibly stressful for Chaplin and the crew around him. Chaplin, by his own admission, became obsessive and, in his words, a neurotic perfectionist. Tension arose between himself and Virginia Sherrill, who spoke publicly that she never liked Chaplin and he never liked her. Charlie obsessed over filming the Tramp's first meeting at the flower stand with a blind girl and attempted the scene so many times he ended up putting it aside to be filmed later, as it was taking months to get right. One of Chaplin's angriest moments on set involved Virginia Sherrill once again. Some say she came back late from an appointment, and others that she was just complaining a lot. Either way, Chaplin lost it and fired her on the spot for whatever the reason. Eat your heart out, Gordon Ramsay. Chaplin impulsively replaced her with Georgie Hale, Chaplin's leading lady in the movie The Gold Rush. Chaplin liked her screen test, but realised he had shot far too much to now reshoot all of the characters' scenes. Georgia Hale's footage incredibly is still out there, included on the DVD release and first seen in the documentary Unknown Chaplin. Charlie swallowed his pride and rehired Cheryl, but was out of pocket when the actress demanded she got a raise of $75 per week. Chaplin also ended up lashing out at another actor, replacing Henry Clive as the eccentric millionaire with Harry Myers, when Clive refused to fall into water in a necessary scene when he claimed to have a cold. Wow, Chaplin was a savage back here, wasn't he? However, he did express regret in his autobiography, at least about how things went with him and Virginia, putting it down mainly to his obsessive mental state at the time. Chaplin spent 1930 actually making headway with the film and in September of that year, finished shooting the iconic final scene, which took six days. Chaplin said he was happy with Cheryl's performance in the scene, stating that she finally understood the role. Retrospectively, Chaplin spoke of the memorable final scene and claimed he was not acting in it, 
calling it not overacted at all and a truly beautiful moment in which he was standing outside of himself and looking. By the end of 1930, Chaplin had wrapped filming. Overall, in terms of years, this was Chaplin's longest piece of work. It was in production for over three years, although he only shot for 180 days. See Lights like marked the first time Chaplin himself composed the film score. Chaplin preferred his movies to have live sound, but by the 1930s most theatres had gotten rid of their orchestras. The director composed and wrote the score in six weeks with composer Arthur Johnson and said the intention was to convey a genuine translation of the emotions on screen. Chaplin recorded the score in five days with musical arranger Alfred Newman. When it came to the release, Chaplin was very nervous about the film's reception due to silent films being obsolete, and a preview at Los Angeles Tower Theatre two weeks before the national premiere played poorly to an unenthusiastic crowd. Things turned around very quickly at the premiere on January 30th, 1931, at the Los Angeles Theatre, in which the film received a standing ovation. Famous guests included Albert Einstein, and Chaplin spoke of the legendary thinker's eyes being teary when he saw him at the end of the film. City Lights became one of Chaplin's most financially successful and acclaimed movies, and immediate theatrical rentals came to 2 million, with a 4.25 million worldwide, which was of course a much larger amount back then. Reviews at the time were very positive, and one critic for the Los Angeles Examiner said he had never seen such an orgy of laughs. Funny choice of words, but okay, it was the 1930s. One critic, however, writing for The Nation, was critical and criticised the silent format, calling the film Chaplin's most feeble. Over the many years since its release, City Lights has endured with critics, with critic James Adji writing in 1949 that the ending scene was the greatest piece of acting ever committed to celluloid. Beloved film critic Roger Ebert gave the film 4 out of 4 stars and placed it on his great movies list. It is generally regarded as a masterpiece, holding a 95% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the consensus reading, this is one of the best underdog romances ever, with an ending that will light up any heart. There's so much purity and innocence that exists in City Lights. It's one of those films that really restores your faith in life and makes you happy. The film is delivered through the lens of someone who has nothing, isn't very capable, but at the end of the day, is able to touch all of our hearts because of the size and eagerness of his own. The medium of silence adds so much to the film, it just has this storybook vibe, a sense of magic, a feeling of pages turning. It really does feel like you're a child reading a storybook and looking at the illustrations, and The Tramp is a great character for that. Chaplin perfected this childlike, innocent and bumbling underdog that so many comedy characters went on to be inspired by, even to this day. Every comedic actor was pretty much influenced by Chaplin's tramp in some way through the years, and that's a stunning achievement. But I think what still to this day sets the tramp apart is the earnest and well-meaning nature of the character. So many comedy actors forget this, not realising that it's not necessarily what the tramp does that's funny, but how he does it and the time Chaplin takes to add little touches that capture your heart. When he first meets the flower girl, that scene is so sweet and well done, as we see both of these characters slowly open up to each other and the beginning of their connection, with a little bit of comedy thrown in. Scenes like this show the beauty of silence, it's about the facial expressions and the connection, two people who are lonely and rejected coming together in an innocent chance meeting. The fact she's a flower girl just adds even more tenderness to the scene. The character really does represent a possible blooming in the tramp's life, after he's been saddled with bad luck for so long. The film really is about the possibility of what can happen in a day if your heart is open. The tramp gets into good situations and hopeful ones, but at the same time his chance encounters lead him to stressful and worrying situations also. One of the funniest examples of this is the tramp meeting the eccentric millionaire by chance. That scene where the millionaire is drunk and is attempting to commit suicide and the tramp manages to change his mind is tragic but also hilarious. It's a sweet idea that an accidental encounter saved this man's life. The fact that it happens with the tramp nearly dying himself by being pulled into the sea by mistake just makes it all the more of an absurd situation. It's hysterical, but at the same time you feel awkward laughing, as the idea of the suicide attempt behind it is so morbid. This is an example of Chaplin taking one of those terrible things in the human experience and transforming it into a slapstick scene that ends hopefully. It's also incredibly charming how that scene ends with the millionaire saying he's going to take the tramp home with him 
and the tramp is sure to remember the flower that the girl gave him before he leaves. Wonderful little touches like that just make you fall in love with this character. But that's not all to the story with the millionaire. The drunken millionaire takes the tramp out and treats him as the friend that saved his life. But then in the morning, he can't remember him and tells the butler to throw him out. The tramp then keeps running back into the millionaire when he is drunk. And he recognises him, embraces him and spends time with him and then sobers up and treats him like garbage that he discards. It's hilarious that the butler, who sees the tramp both when the millionaire is drunk and sober, still just does what he's told and throws him out despite knowing it's him. It's a funny yet sad element of the film and again is an example of Chaplin mixing humour with sadness and bad luck. Our heart goes out to the tramp yet at the same time it's genuinely funny to see his friend forget him and turn on him at the drop of a hat. It's just such a random situation. The tramp gradually gets closer to the blind girl and when she falls ill he goes round to look after her. To see these two people who are ignored by society find each other and smile and giggle just fills your heart with joy. However the blind girl is going through financial difficulty and the tramp promises her he will get her out of it. Nowadays we would look at scenarios like this as perhaps the guy sucking up to the girl to get her to fall in love with him. But you don't get that vibe here. The tramp genuinely cares. His concern for this woman comes from a real place. And that makes it mean so much. I honestly don't know how anyone could watch this film and dislike the character. It would be a real challenge. That wide eyed and longing look on Chaplin's face tells you all you need to know. The tramp is real, he's not forcing anything. And that's why there is nothing cynical about this film. Kindness is at the centre of everything that happens and you could believe it way more than you would today. One of the zaniest and most memorable moments in the film is the boxing scene where the tramp enters himself in a match to raise money for the blind girl. This entire scene is bonkers and just seems so random. It's crazy that this early on in movies, Chaplin was creating surreal out of the box imagery. I mean think about it, this little man with his hat and moustache suddenly being put amongst big tough men in a boxing locker room. It's some true early fish out of water stuff and very creative. I mean the boxing match itself is just as crazy. A mix of the tramp running away, flailing around and then randomly throwing punches and managing to somehow do well before quite literally launching himself at his opponent is just absurd. So hilarious because you have no idea what's going to happen in this fight as the tramp shifts from doing well to getting hurt. I love the fact that Chaplin still keeps this insane situation grounded as the tramp imagines the blind girl in his corner at one point to remind himself why he's doing this and also to remind the audience of the enduring and real love that is lingering underneath this screwball scene. So I'm going to close out this video by talking about the iconic ending. But if you haven't seen the movie, I'd strongly recommend watching the film first. It's a fantastic piece of work and a must see. And this is an ending you don't want spoiled, so feel free to come back to this video when you've seen the movie. The ending is iconic for a reason. Filmmakers have tried to emulate these genuine emotions ever since and still struggle to match the true humanity of this final moment. I love how Chaplin sets it up. The tramp has been released from prison and he's wandering the streets picking things up on the street and looking quite run down and pathetic. A child on the street shoots him with a pea shooter and the whole thing is set up to show how the tramp is the lowest he's ever been. No one respects him and he feels he has lost the one amazing thing he had. He walks past the blind girl's new flower shop which she had funded with the money the tramp raised for her before going to prison. The tramp realises it's her and stares through the window. The beauty of this scene is the tramp does not know that she can now see and the whole scene is a build up to him realising she is finally able to look at him and realise who he is. The looks on the faces of the two actors is a complete masterclass, your heart goes out to both of them. This ending is a wonderful moment of the ordinary becoming extraordinary, of love enduring, of acts of kindness not being forgotten and not having been for nothing. Her face when she tells him she can now see is so heartwarming and emotional and then Chaplin's final expression has gone down as one of the most memorable in movie history. Capturing even an ounce of the humanity this scene does would make any filmmaker happy. 
This ending is quite simply timeless. It doesn't matter how many times you see it, it will only get more bittersweet. So movie buffs, it's over to you. What do you think of City Lights? Let's talk about this classic movie in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please click on another film discussion on the screen now of a similar movie, the Italian classic Life is Beautiful. And please consider subscribing for more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the comments.